Hi, I'm Austin Wintery, and as with previous years, I like to begin the year by giving some, some shout-outs and some praise to the work of friends and colleagues of mine that, uh, by and large, may have gone unmissed or just otherwise I felt really deserved some, uh, some singling out. So here are my 2022 Cherished Gems. I'm starting the list with Justin Hurwitz's newly Golden Globe winning score to Babylon, Damien Chazelle's latest film. It would be tempting to assume lightning can't simply strike multiple times uh, with a director-composer relationship since they have basically had tremendous collaborations in the form of Whiplash, then La La Land, then First Man. Um, but at least if only musically, Babylon seems to just absolutely join those ranks. So this was a score that I went into just figuring, oh, I'd probably enjoy it. But the deeper in I got, I just found myself going, damn, this guy really can write. This is one of my absolute favorite game now franchises of the last few years, which is a Plague Tale. The new one, Plague Tale Requiem, with music by Olivier de Riviere, is an absolute masterclass in elegantly integrated adaptive audio that is also musically highly distinct. He kind of took the quasi-medieval palette that he had developed in the first one and expanded it, particularly with the use of voices um, a choir from Estonia that I found just endlessly haunting. And the game is also just great. I love the game. So recommend both. Another that likely has made everybody's list and has certainly gotten no shortage of award nominations with surely more to come is Metal Hellsinger with uh, music collectively by Two Feathers. This was one where I really, I genuinely confess I had my doubts. I, I'm a huge fan of Doom. I'm a huge fan of when gameplay and music are integrated seamlessly, but I'm not usually a fan of when music is made into some kind of gimmick within the gameplay. And so I, I went into this one a little bit trepidatiously despite knowing people involved and wishing them well and being glad for their success. And I stand corrected in terms of my initial guess. This is, first off, the game's really fun and kind of operatically over the top, but the sort of gamification of the interactive music system is so satisfying that within seconds, I found myself going, okay, you know what? This is awesome. I can't deny this is awesome. Fears, what faithless, what sanity, what fault? By venomous design, through wrath and ashes, left behind all your signs and reasoning that brings it to its fall. So, next on the list, somebody who I think has been on this every year since I started making these is Joe Trapanese and his film Spiderhead. This is a Netflix film directed by Joe Kosinski, who also directed Top Gun Maverick, so needless to say, he had a hell of a year. Um, the score begins with this interesting and kind of creepy use of voices interacting with um, the London Contemporary Orchestra, and from that to the next, to the next, to the next, it's just cue after cue of interesting colors, unique solos, and a, and a kind of music that seems defined by a curiosity to try something new, try something different. That's often the case with Joe, but he's also a very complete musician who, as when I mentioned him earlier in the case of the Lady and the Tramp remake, he has a versatility that is, uh, I think, extraordinary. So this was a score that I just found every moment I listened to, it held my interest, it was interesting, and demonstrates why his career continues to flourish and kick ass. Mm -hmm. 
Next on the list is Gorilla's follow-up to Horizon Zero Dawn, Horizon Forbidden West. A conglomerate of talented composers came together to work on this one, uh, some of whom are, are uh, friends of mine and, and all of whom I feel grateful to call colleagues because, honestly, this score kicked ass. It is full of fascinating and wonderful detail, and despite the fact that it's something like seven or eight hours worth of music, every last tiny little moment seems really cared for, really sort of carefully put together. The big action and uh, set piece kind of cues are just absolutely loaded with fascinating and savage sort of percussion. And then there's some moments of real lyricism. I absolutely adore the main theme, Julie Elvin, a uh, featured singer who uh, returns and, and some truly haunting use of bass flute and, and a, a beautifully captured very intimate group of maybe eight or nine strings recorded at air. Every little detail of it, plus the integration of these these uh, very kind of rustic and acoustic elements with slick and all things considered subtle um, electronic music sound design for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, it's really, really, really good. Next, and we're still in my list of the obvious ones, is Cult of the Lamb with music by Riverboy. Uh, this is a game that really, I think, caught all of us by surprise. It is shockingly fun, addicting, clever, funny. Those little dancing, idling animation cycles are so adorable it hurts. Uh, and the music is surprisingly effective and surprisingly memorable. It's one of those that, that um, I don't know what I was expecting. I started hearing praise of it and I kept hearing people say, you know, the music is quite earwormy, quite quite catchy. But for some reason, I, I just assumed that I would hear it and go, yeah, it's, it's solid, it's fine. But honestly, I gotta say, I love it. it. It far exceeded my expectations, even though I don't really know what framed my expectations. In particular, as a as a stylistic choice deserves a shout out because it's not just well executed, it's not just that, oh, it, it works great in the game, but particularly with this use of kind of edited and seemingly kind of sampled and re-pitched voices, it crafts an aesthetic that it owns so thoroughly that very quickly music just feels kind of natively Cult of the Lamb-ish. And I think that's one of the highest achievements that a composer can make in crafting a score is that certain gestures just start to become so connected to it that it's hard to imagine anything else. So this is another one that's gotten a lot of hype and it deserves all of it. All right, to cap off my obvious list is a composer who has had a truly, truly wild year, Bear McCreary, uh, somebody I am very grateful to call a, a close friend and uh, a colleague who is just a continuous source of inspiration in his body of work. It is, it is almost unprecedented to have simultaneous releases of one of the single biggest games and one of the single biggest television projects ever made in both cases, God of War Ragnarok, with Sony Santa Monica and, uh, of course, Amazon's Rings of Power TV show. These two scores are just sprawling and genuinely deserving of that term epic, which is so often overused and I think really cements Bear's place as one of the absolute grand chief composers of lush operatic grand orchestral scores. Uh, but it was for neither of those that I wanted to include him on this list because sort of nestled within those and a handful of other releases was an animated film called Pause of Fury, The Legend of Hank, with this pretty incredible all-star voice talent cast, uh, not least of which Mel Brooks is involved, which makes me happy to no end. Um, and, and Bear wrote not only a suitably fitting kind of like uh, spaghetti western meets, you know, 70s kung fu film vibe, but even down to the way that he recorded the orchestra in a kind of uh, interestingly, very, very almost uh, borderline claustrophobic way. It doesn't have that grand epic sprawling feel of a Rings of Power where you're going for scale. He wanted that kind of, you know, Quincy Jones, 
late 60s, early 70s kind of funk orchestra sound, and he nailed it. It's really, really good. So to finish off my list, here are a few that you may have genuinely missed that I really, really appreciated. So first off, Isabella Summers' score to the Paramount Plus Limited on The Offer. First off, yes, there may be uh, fictionalized elements to this show or, or exaggerated in terms of the retelling of the history of the making of The Godfather. But if nothing else, as a piece of entertaining television, I loved this show. I thought it was great. And... Given that The Godfather has among the most iconic scores of all time by Nino Rota, uh, it would be tempting to score a show about the making of it in a manner that feels like it's trying to pay homage or might even be deferential to that. And to her credit, I thought that she managed to carve out something that felt totally distinct from that. It wasn't uh, an obvious choice. It's one that I wouldn't necessarily have thought to make. And so I found myself constantly just smiling while watching it and going, that was that was cool. That was a great choice. It really embraced the sort of carnival a aspect of filmmaking and of that particular film's making, but uh, also in a way that, you know, it kind of rolls with a little bit of 70s flavor. And yet it's not a period score either. It feels very today. So I think it's a small target area to have landed on. And uh, I think it's worth checking out. And it's also worth watching the show if you have it. It's 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 really fun. Next is uh, the game Blacktail, which only just came out and which has music by a friend from Poland, Arkadiusz uh, Rykowski. This score really caught me by surprise. It starts with this really striking use of a very kind of clearly Slavic or otherwise Eastern European vocals. And, and it kind of goes into more subtle territory from there. But it was just one of those where I didn't really know what to expect from the game. I, I played it because I was sent a code and I, I thought I would try it out. And the music just immediately made an impression. I didn't know at first who had done it. And so then I went actually looking up. Who, who wrote this? This is a really strong opening. And of course, it's Arkadiusz who is already impressed the hell out of me the last uh, half decade or so with scores like Layers of Fear and The Medium, and so it came as no surprise to see his name on the soundtrack. Next up is not actually a score, it's just a straight up um, electronic music album called Lighthouse by the great Chad Mossholder who uh, serves as audio director at id and has done incredible work and sound design with them for a number of years. A lot of people may not know this, that he releases albums periodically and they are deep, complex, nuanced explorations of sound on a level that is extraordinary and uh, especially rewarding if you listen to in headphones so I, I can't recommend uh, his releases enough it is one of those that is um, uh, driven by a kind of curiosity about the nature of sound itself if I can summarize it like that I don't know that he would necessarily summarize it that way but I find it um, inspiring and imaginative and the kind of thing that broadens my horizons as a composer and producer <laughs> Next up was uh, an indie game called Potionomics with music by Greg Nicolette. This was one that I saw Greg sharing on social media about and kind of had made a mental note to check out. Greg's a very nice guy and, and talented, but I, I really didn't know anything about it. It's not also the kind of game I typically get 
especially into. And so it wasn't a super high priority for me. But I heard a friend comment, oh, this has a very kind of earnest Disney-esque quality to it. And that perked me up because historically the bar for Disney scores is exceptionally high. Some of the greatest composers in the history of film have contributed to Disney. So I found myself going, okay, that's a high bar to set. And then when I listened to it, I just kept thinking to myself, this is somebody who is screaming from the rooftop, I dare you to ignore how good I am. And I don't mean that to suggest any level of hubris or arrogance on Greg's part, far from it. There's a great quote from Steve Martin of, be so good that they can't ignore you or they can't not notice you. And that's to me what this score was because it is such a beautifully committed to score. It would be tempting to approach a game about crafting potions with something minimalistic or very understated or, or kind of just vampy and, and, and backgroundy. And, and uh, my God, that's not the case here. Not only is it lush and sweeping and, and, and beautiful at times, but it's also full of kind of raunchy jazz and, and uh, all beautifully executed and performed and mixed. And so it, it's a score that I think uh, shouts Greg's name from the rooftop to any game developers or filmmakers that, that hopefully will catch wind of it and, and would be honor bound to provide him opportunities um, as a result of. So uh, highly recommend a wonderful little surprise by a, by a very nice guy and, and clearly very talented one as well. Next up is for sure my favorite film score of the year, which is John Powell's score to Don't Worry, Darling by Olivia Wilde. Um, Powell has long been, I think, one of the single most talented and interesting composers in Hollywood for 20 years running now. Um, his career kind of exploded onto the scene with the Shrek films in collaboration with Harry Gregson Williams and then really took a notch up with the Bourne Identity franchise. But especially once he got into the world of, of uh, solo scoring animation, Horton Hears a Who and Robots, How to Train Your Dragon franchise, he really did establish himself as um, no less than the kind of heir apparent to the adventurous and versatile writing of someone like Jerry Goldsmith. And so I, I do mean it in all earnestness that he is very possibly the best composer in the whole of the industry today. And so it's despite that level of praise, uh, shocking that he comes out with something that just sounds nothing like anything he'd done before and yet still unmistakably him. And so the use of voice, the kind of more understated use of the orchestra, everything about this score is just bursting with a creativity and of somebody looking to figure out a different way to score a film, to find something that feels special, that feels unique. I think because the film didn't really catch on with people, the score has kind of gone a little bit unnoticed outside of soundtrack nerd circles. And that's a crime because here's a composer that already has kind of cemented his place within the pantheon of composers and yet managed to throw something uh, into the fire that was just superb. So I, I don't think I've heard any film score, at least, that... Um, tops that one for me this year it's just it's just evidence that the name john powell carries weight and meaning yet again It's interesting what these all have in common. You know, a, a Plague Tale, Metal Hellsinger, uh, Spiderhead, Cult of the Lamb, uh, large portions of Horizon Forbidden West, Don't Worry Darlin'. It seems like a huge part of my 2022 was fascination with voices and make of that what you will. And to finish off the list is also another non film, non video game score, but an album that I love and whose background story is just the best ever. This is uh, the the debut album 
of 95-year-old Cuban immigrant Angela Alvarez. She is the grandmother of a friend of mine, composer Carlos Alvarez, who I've known for a long time and who is an incredibly talented composer and who just sort of made it his mission the last few years to help his grandmother see her dream of being a singer and songwriter and performer come to life, having set her dream aside for 70 years for the sake of of escaping totalitarianism in Cuba, coming to the U.S. and uh, raising her family, and so having clearly successfully done so and 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 producing, uh, if nothing else, a wonderful grandson in the form of Carlos, uh, set upon this adventure and her 90s. She recently won the Latin Grammy for Best New Artist, which is just amazing, and her album, honestly, is, is beautiful. And, and so it's one of those where, this is one of those cases where it's not just an endearing story and then you hear the music and go, oh, it's fine, but what a story. It, it's honestly beautiful. Um, it, it really it comes from a place of soul. The performances are wonderful and uh, you just can't not fall in love with it. So I can't resist ending my list for 2022's Cherished Gems with Angela Alvarez. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, leave comments below on, on ones that uh, I didn't mention or, or any, you know, uh, wrestling with my choices that you want to make and and of course uh what were some of yours i, I love to hear it so um thank you so much uh plenty more content coming for this channel this coming year got a lot of things i'm cooking up and thinking about and and uh, some very exciting new releases that i'll be sharing behind the scenes on as well so happy new year thanks for checking it out aquellos que no han realizado su sueño aunque la vida es difícil siempre hay una salida Y con fe y amor lo puedes lograr. Se los prometo que nunca es tarde. Los amo a todos y que Dios me los bendiga. Como siempre brilla el sol.